is the chair of the Addison Collection Trust for the board of the Bethlehem Gallery. David has been working with people who are living with complex psychosis for over 30 years. I'm also one-handed, so I can't hold the microphone. They can only do one thing at once. So if you can't hear me, would you wave from the back? I hope I'm a grand finale as opposed to an anti-climax, because I think there's been four amazing presentations. Um, as very much that's my kind of who I am, I'm going to mainly talk about the Edmondson Collection and also this project called Raw Material um, during the course of my, hopefully, under seven minutes. <laughs> And the, the talk is very much about a man called Edward Edmondson, um, who was an artist, who was a pioneer of art mm -hmm. therapy, and also created this collection called the Edmondson Collection, which has involved my life for the last 10 years, probably a bit pathologically. <laughs> and around the collection spin these words like art, brute, studio art, outside art, which we touched on, and I don't know if we need to dwell on, um, but Art by excluded people, unusual art, different kind of art. Um, Edward came to Nevin Hospital in 1946. This is a painting from the collection. This person painted many pictures of Nevin, and we don't know their name or their gender or their date, but I quite like the two dustbins in the, in the foreground <laughs> and, and the, the fence, which probably saw um, asylums at that time, he would put his dustbins into the bottom. But it was a reference to Beckett's own game, I don't know. Um, asylums were pretty grim in 19, they were always pretty grim, but they were pretty grim in 1946. They'd had a bad war, they were starved of resources, starved of staff. There was lots of brutal psychiatric physical treatment scum, the bottom is insulin coma therapy. But also it was the years that a lot of social, creative, and occupational interventions were emerging. So it was a bit of a mixed bag that Edward turned up and set up an art studio in 1946. Probably one of the first in the world to be in an asylum run by an artist who provided a safe space and material which is then what we were going to create and grow to the same. This idea you, pro you provide someone where people can express themselves freely, you give them materials, you give them space, but you let them do what they want. So this is Edward's studio around the late 1950s. So the various manifestations, so everyone had their own easel. He used to do groups of about 40 people at once. And he wouldn't intervene in any way. He would just give the slightest guidance. He, you can see him standing up. He would stroll around, apparently he was very Buddhist, like the woman called Rebecca Hoffler, who we were discussing earlier. She runs an amazing museum in Baltimore, called the American Vision and Art Museum. And she describes Edward as a the British Buddha. So apparently he's a silent presence, enabling, supporting. And these were people facing great distress. They were in asylums for 30, 40 years. If they had what we call a mental disorder now, it would have been pretty much untreated. But lots of people were there for other reasons, like illegitimate kids or whatever. And I think that studio must have been a, a beautiful place to go to in that context. He ended up with 100,000 pieces. He edited that down to 5,500 when he left Nevin in 1981. They demolished his studio within days and they did the rest of the collection within weeks. Um, so we've got 5,500 pieces by about 250 people. And um, we've been very fortunate to get a good link with the Welcome Library, who are phenomenal. They're phenomenally wealthy, they're sophisticated, and they're saving the collection for it. But I thought I'd only talk about two of our artists and also what the impact has been the link with the welcome, which was partly facilitated by my reframing the Adamson collection, not an art therapy historical asylum collection, but as outsider art. And that sleight of hand, calling it art, not archive, made everyone interested in it again. Mm -hmm. And he's been out of sight for like 30 years. So First of all, I'm going to talk about Mary Bishop. We don't know much about Mary Bishop. She died in 1981. We do know her dad died in the First World War, and Mummy took her to the Eastern Station every day to watch the bodies being brought back from the front line mm. to make sure she really grieved her father. So come World War II, she has a psychotic breakdown when serving in the Women's Air Force and ends up in Netherlands for 35 years. Mm. 
So this is one of her earliest works, uh, for demonstration. She's almost, there's almost always a solitary woman in her paintings, I'm assuming it's her we don't know, and everyone was really clear you should never put in pictures what you don't know. She, but but she, had been, she did discuss this picture. That is her naked, being examined, demonstrated on two medical students. The crowd. Called the demonstration. And even when I started my medical training the, a long time ago, late 70s, we'd still bring patients into lecture theatres with about 100 medical students, to not naked, but to demonstrate them. Very exposed. And she painted a series of pictures about her relationship with her doctor. Here she is with a bouquet of flowers saying, I only want a doctor I can love. Here she is with that huge hand holding her head down, being stabbed. Here she is being whipped, dropping her little bouquet of flowers. So a series of pictures communicating um, uh, Mary Bishop's relationship with her doctors, how she felt disempowered. But she wanted their love, but she felt disempowered by them. Doctors, psychiatrists were very dominant forces in silence, as we probably still are, but yeah, we left them, we're not. In the 60s, when we, we had 35 years of her work, we have 300 of her paintings, so this is a real much in that image. She painted a series of these creed of her, Cries from the Heart, which were her attempts to express her own feelings. So this is her sadness. She calls this my guilt. I think the use of colour is amazing. The, the background, the way that she has developed her <coughs> backgrounds. And she was almost certainly untrained, um, and she just was in a wood studio for 35 years every day. This is Creed of Kurt. Again, it does communicate a sense of a distress, but it's the beauty of women and men. This is the horror of intercourse, so those snakes coming out the mouth. There's two white snakes emerging from a mouth, so the horror of intercourse makes you sort of show what they don't know about the sense. And this, this double headed, blurred double headed, I'm in two minds. The second one of our artists I want to speak to about is a woman called Brenda Froelands. Again, we don't know that much about her. She was also in Devon for 35 years. She only left for the asylum in Shut and she only died a few years ago. She started her off by collecting pebbles on asylum seaside trips and then copying butterflies onto them. And we have hundreds of these butterflies meticulously copied onto pebbles. Edward didn't intervene, he didn't direct, he didn't guide, but he did, his partner's still alive and a great friend of mine. He did once say, that, that they, they say to Brenda's Rose, wouldn't you think about trying something else, maybe? You've done 400 bus flights, maybe <laughs> there's a scope. The asylums in London are all outside London and they're surrounded by fields with flints. So she picked up a flint and started painting on flints. Now we have about 200 of these complex flints. And I'm going to take you to that one side, that's the front, and that's the back. So I'll take you back so you've got the idea of that last one. So she collected flints from the field. She didn't. She doesn't interfere with the, the, the flint itself. But she finds she covers it with patterns, flowers, abstract designs, and she finds faces or animals coming almost out, emerging out of the shape of the flint. I mean, I, personally, I think her work is stunning. And you can see that's quite one side is very full face, the other side is quite distorted, and all stunning. <laughs> and that's the other so you see the, the two sides so she paints every surface and they're they're really hard to the sad thing is as it's now outside of art this stuff is going behind the glass of the art world these used to be in the thriving cabin in my office you could come and hold them and play with them because they're varnish you can play with them this is one of her first pieces, which is about the size of a child's skull. It's called Skullhead Wire. It looks, the, the bone texture is like a skull, but the eyes are very mournful and beautiful. And again, she's found these eyes and the shape in, in, the, in the, the shape of the flint. She doesn't impose anything on it apart from a, a, a flint. On the underside is this beautiful watercolour. 
and it's really intricate. You, if you look, the longer you look, the more you see little people, fish, flowers, crouching people. And she told Adam, and you can see the nose at the bottom is the nose of the that nose that he had. She said that was a portrait of her mind. And this isn't the last one I'm going to show you of hers, and it's about 18 inches high. It's we had it on the table in the welcome room, and people were coming around saying it's a some sort of stone age piece, because obviously I think the flit does refer to old kind of old material. And this thing about materials crops up a lot in this kind of art. As I say, now these things, about, about three years ago we relaunched this collection. This collection been, it was referenced, spoken about, but forgotten. It was stashed in member hospital, which is down the road from the World Care Studio, in the City Mental Health Hospital, Midler Brixton, hardcore inner city psychiatry, and this collection is just scattered around in boxes and shelves and colours. And we first showed it at that gallery in Nottingham, I can never pronounce the name of. Anyway, none of us can pronounce the name. So, this is the first. <laughs> so you can see the skull head is at this end. Um, the Ralph Chinese are our creative director, and he suggested it was shown on a, on a mirror. Because these things are really, often with this art, they're really hard to exhibit because they're not designed to be shown in white cube spaces. They're designed for the person's only intention. So they're often hard to shut. So you can see, and then you can see the, 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 the huge large flint at the other end. This is this one so down from the other side. And you can see on the walls and um, the Mary Bishop's demonstration, Mary Bishop's Critica. So this was the first, this was not in September 2013, this was the first time the collection being shown for 30 years. Uh, the, the wonderful show Art in the Asylum that um, Victoria Tishman curated. We have six pieces on long-term loan to the reading room at the Welcome. So if you want to go and see those pieces, um, the reading room at the Welcome, second floor, free, Euston Road, phenomenal space. We're tucked in the corner by the straight jacket, on the paper, which you can wear. Um, and so you can see, so you can see the skull head, you can see the one I showed you earlier at the screen, right? The six of them. And they're intricately shown with mirrors and <coughs> you know, attempting to catch all you see the reflections behind it, but you get some sense that they so they're in a mirrored box that you can and suspended. So these objects were created with flints found in Field Man Hospital by a woman in Edward Studios uh, during a 35 year admission. They're now private place in a major cultural institution of welcome. And I think that does something about the meaning of the objects. They've become from therapeutic objects to historic objects to art objects. And I think that's maybe something we would all to talk about. The, that, we, um, last February, we had a reception in the state rooms of the House of Commons and the House of Parliament, which are four amazingly elaborate palace rooms. The Speaker has his own palace, I now know. So you see the large print again in a reception, and you see Mary Bishop's work, and you see what we were up against. Look at the red and the gold and the panelling. And I think we held our own. I think Mary held her own. You can see demonstration, the, the, the doctor patient series, the one she's the one on the bench you see saying, um, I wish I could have a doctor I could trust. And I think we held our own. There was a back room where there's a bed that only, the monarch only sleeps on the night before their coronation, and we filled that up with sort of homoerotic pictures, and we got away with it. <laughs> <laughs> that's a portrait of Edward in the state room. And if you see the, the window, that building, you can see the lower building. That is actually the Edward Adamson Centre for Mental Health at St. Thomas's Hospital, which is so. That little studio in Nevin in 1946 ends up in the state rooms and the centres at St Thomas's. Um, we had this is now moving on to the Adamson Festival we had two years ago, 2014. And again, part of recreating and re getting people to remember um, the collection. 
And this was the closing event, and it became a collaborator with this project called Raw Sounds for Materials. And Raw Materials is amazing. It's a, a, a music project in Brixton for people with lived experience of psychosis. And many of my, my ward is a secure ward. People are quite psychotic, they're quite violent. The people go for my unit only with nothing to, to the music studio and to do music. They have high production standards. They produce, they rap, they do poetry. And I, it's great when I go down to, to go to rehearsal session because I see some of my patients who I usually see in the telemeter with F or Q, W. See them taking out that angle on drum or setting them, creating some. When well, you mentioned rapping earlier, I thought you were this kind of rapping. <laughs> That's really kind of rapping. And for this particular gig, they came to an exhibition we had of, of um, the Ellen Sinclair and the Monthly. They went back to the studio and they wrote poems, songs, and raps, and to go inspired by the stories they heard. And there was a little film we could have shown. The technology defeated us. But I found it touching that these young inner city people, um, dealing with the difficulty of living in Brixton would be touched by the paintings we select for them in the collection and go back and create new materials so the collection communicated to them. And they were horrified to know people like them would have been shut away for 30 or 40 years and think, oh, they're not, they're, they're shut away in different ways. And, and you'll notice we had a, the, um, the picture of the Netherlands at the back. We had a, a running slideshow while they were performing. We had a running slideshow of works from the Adams and Collection, so they were performing in front of a, a, a huge slideshow. It was a phenomenal event. The wonderful flow of his voice makes you shiver, and then you remember the image of Mary Bishop's image of um, I'm in two lines from the band in full. He said if you expected breaks in the very kind of mid-diverse crowd, and that is my pitch. Thank you. Mm. <laughs> We just start the questions anyway. <laughs> okay. Um, um, I, I think the seven minutes was slightly short. <laughs> no, this is fine. This means the technical questions are going to be being thought through. Now, I'm um, going to pose a question, and I'd obviously like you all to answer your own time, but um, given a sort of not huge amount, <laughs> just enough. Um, art can be seen as a primary form of communication predating verbal and written language. What is it about the artist, their work, and the way it's being created that allows it to communicate so powerfully without the need for words in verbal language? So it's something about how art can exist as a primary form of communication. It can be its own language, only created by the creator. And um, what are your thoughts about that? And how important that is in a society which is dictated and often sort of, you know, led by language and words and concepts and thought in that. So, what would you say before, you mean historically or in a person's life? And in terms of... Take, you mean historically, did you are saying that <coughs> visual imagery became a form of No, 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 I'm saying that... Uh, you, could, you, I mean, you, could, you could assume... I'm sorry, I just understood you. you could, no, you could, you could be seen that art, or the idea of making and forms and the use of colour and line, could be a much more immediate and primary form of communication yeah, so. beyond the construct of a language which is a sort of artifice in a way. We are far more able to make marks and to think in sort of pattern and yeah, shape yeah, yeah, yeah. than to use a verbal language. So is there something about the ability we may need to sort of be able to tap into that that allows people to create their own language that sidesteps that? And how important is that? Yeah? Does that sort of That's make sense? Yeah. Yeah. So maybe, if you want to chip in there. Maybe somebody else. People point okay. to my voice. Well, well, no, no. Can, can I start it? Yeah. Art, I think art can say things that words, I mean, you know, it's the old sort of uh, proverb about art, a picture can speak a thousand words or something. Um, there's that side of it. It can say more, more, more efficiently, arguably, but it can also say different things. And again, proverbially, people say, you know, say it with. Flowers, or you know, <laughs> say it, you know, say it with a picture. You can say something different, I think, with a picture or a sculpture or a dance. You know, it's, it's, 
when words often, like they're doing now, fail to communicate <laughs> what we're trying to say. Um, so I think it's as, maybe as simple as that. It's just a, a different way as well as a more efficient way. Okay, um, look at Judith's work. Mm -hmm. Perhaps you'd like to read that written way in process of making. Mm -hmm. And how, I mean, that's very powerful, isn't it? It's that we all probably within us have an innate in the way of making that we've somehow lost. How important, I mean, that sort of consideration is for the narcissist and that the creative growth does. I, th I think so. And I, I do think there's a, a place that's far deeper than words can mm -hmm. ever reach. Mm -hmm. and, and often people who are nonverbal can be <clears throat> more in touch with that and can reach it. And then they, and many times they speak for us, you know, they touch a place in us that we haven't been able to reach for ourselves. Yeah, yeah. There's, there's a sort of universality, but it's a Jungian thing in a way, isn't it? <laughs> they want to get up, but is there something deeper that connects through? Yeah. yeah, I think for sure. I think so. I guess I have a few thoughts. One is on Erwin's position, I don't think everyone is saying the same thing here, that there's something self healing about the creation of art and communicating with yourself. And that impenetrable philosopher Jules Deleuze talked about taking a part of yourself and making actual as an object helps you address that part of yourself. So a lot of artists I've spoken to talk about the act of creation is more important than the communication mm -hmm. self-discipline that's the third mm -hmm. thing. I guess I'm going to get scientific here, but art must have some evolutionary purpose because why is it around us? Why is it being the, the first records of art? So it seems to me art must have some purpose like self-healing, so ways of making. Also, I can't remember who it was, but one of the linguists said you only need verbal language to be able to lie to you. You don't really need verbal language unless you're an artist. I mean, I kind of like that. Art is kind of honest in a way. Yeah. And words are very yeah. dishonest. Mm -hmm. well, thank you. the artist extraordinary and the idea is that um, one of the artists Marion Walker talks about how her art is a way to negotiate what she calls the scary surfaces of the world and her her art is her way of trying to somehow communicate what is too painful to verbalise and I think in, in that way there, there's definitely something really moving and really raw and, and, and powerful I was just going to say that it's, <clears throat> you know, because a lot of the work that's made is so kind of um, raw, I hear that word so overused, <laughs> but it's kind of a real, it really taps into something very deep and basic, and, uh, and yet it's highly sophisticated. Um, we find, because we have so many people come and working in our studios alongside our artists, lots of other artists who come in, they're so inspired, you know, because they find in their own art practice they're, um, they're working on their own, uh, generally, and, you know, they get very stuck with their own art practice. And come, to come into a setting where people are using, developing work in such a free way that's undirected and uh, where things aren't being analysed to the furthest point, um, there isn't an, a, a desire to conceptualise what's happening. It's about the pure process and the making. They find it deeply, deeply inspiring. Mm -hmm. And you know, we have lots of artists who come and work with us. Who, you know, that's one of the best days of their week because they'll they get really inspired by it and they go back to their studio and it clearly informs their work. That's really exciting. You know, that, that it's, it has a big ripple effect. It really, really does. What happens in the studio isn't just contained in that space. It has a big effect on everyone who experiences it being made. You mentioned um, sophistication, though, and what you said. But, uh, people can get hung up on sophistication and skills. Uh, I've, I've run workshops where people say, oh, I can't, I can't do art, you know. I, I, I'm not skilled enough. And I think people need to get off that hook of, they have to be skillful and sophisticated. I think that they somehow should be taught that to just do it. And it's it's yeah. in all of us, I think, some, you know. Uh, 
it just needs people's inhibitions often <coughs> to be sort of, I mean, I, when I was to see, I used to be painfully um, aware of detail and sort of drawing skills as a kid, and now I can't do any of that, and I, uh, but I still have you know, a strong impulse to, to kind of make things, and uh, the workshops I run, I try, I try and, as I say, get people out of this mindset of, uh, of needing to be skillful. I wasn't using the word sophistication in relation to skillful. Well, it was more to kind of counteract the idea of something being raw and therefore basic and crude. No, no. Because I, I, you know, I, I, <clears throat> it's very hard for a lot of people who aren't in this world, aren't in the art world or the outsider art world or working in the world of disability or whatever. And, uh, you know, when they come and see people with learning disabilities artwork, there is still that horrendously awful connection of it being connected to children's art, yeah. which I've spent 20 years battling <laughs> against. And so when I use the word sophistication, I'm coming from a different place. I'm trying to emphasize the fact that the work that the artists that um, I work alongside, their work really is sophisticated in terms of the input that goes into it, um, not in terms of skill. You know, the skills can be basic, um, but what's happening is, 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 is really high up there, yeah, yeah, you know, it's, yeah. it's, it's very important. I think the work is deeply important, and I couldn't do this job if I didn't think that. Yeah. Um, but it's not to do with skills. I mean, I don't, I kind of often say I never teach skills. I'm not a teacher. Um, uh, I share ideas and facilitate, which is a very different thing. But it's, it's, it's trying to just distance it from anything. The word war that gets banded around a lot, but it does sum up a lot. But it's trying to make sure that it, it's not making undermining the work, I suppose. I'm just going to ask you one more question as a panel, then we can open up to the floor. Um, I think sort of what's interesting, we're talking about sort of um, sort of the sort of language that comes from the self, and an innate creativity that people are being supported in spaces to work and, and, and to sort of find means to do. Um, what's interesting is when that then comes into a world where there is interpretation, there is language, and the sort of the, sort of the juncture and the crash between something which is almost unspoken into a world where it needs to be spoken. So, what's your thoughts around interpretation in the way that outsider or more traditional therapeutic art is written about and described, and and, and, and how does that marry up with the intent of the person who made it? Does that, that make sense? So, you know, this, and, and, and the way that, You'd like to say something about that in terms of Judith? Or? Oh, well, in terms of Judith, I think her process was probably the most important part of what she was doing. And I, I doubt very much that she had an intention for things to be interpreted in the way that she may have experienced it. I think she's a very generous, spirited person in a way. And I think she probably, when you said something about this earlier, that the um, the piece, what, whatever the person who is experiencing it, whatever their interpretation is, is valuable mm -hmm. between the piece and that person. Mm -hmm. And I don't know how much the artist's intention mm -hmm. makes any difference, mm -hmm. I think. And it was always very clear you need to be clear to your interpretation, which is why he fell out of sight of um, art therapy, <laughs> not art therapy in the room. He fell out with art therapy in the 70s because it became very psychoanalytic mm. and it became very much interpreting symbols in painting as being something psychological. Adamson really did not approve of that. He thought that's the therapist's projections. Only what, and there was art therapy moved on from that, I mean, art therapy is different now, but mm. on, on the whole. But that very analytical, he really did. And I personally, I'm, I'm with him on that one. And as I say, you were just saying, it's about the making, not of, and, and certainly in the 30s, 40s, there's lots of psychiatrists who thought you could diagnose schizophrenia from painting, or that rubbish. And I, I think art tells you very little about mental illness, really. I mean, the experience of being in asylum is more relevant, I think. I think the Adams and Collection was about being locked up in a place for 40 years as opposed to telling you that much about schizophrenia, which is not a one thing anyway. Mm -hmm. that, yeah, that's that's mm -hmm. well, yeah, whether or not art is therapeutic is an open question, isn't it? Mm -hmm. But what surely art 
is, is like a stress testing of reality. So that sounds a bit. It gives people the chance to create their own little world, uh, and whether it's real or not, and, and, and how important things are to them. Uh, it's just a little sort of laboratory where you can work away at testing those things, I think, and you know, how you interpret that as a spectator is, is interesting. I mean, you've got to, if you want to show this work, you have to put it in a room, I suppose, and, or a space, and someone, if the artist is dead or not around, or can't be bothered to be there, um, then someone's got to interpret it or do some kind of curatorial process. As I mentioned earlier, I love the way a lot of this, this kind of art is really hard to exhibit. Mm. It's fragile, mm. it's not got... It's not the starting to be put on the wall, it's a nightmare for a curator to work out how to show them the stuff you're showing. It's not easy to put the work together, is it? No, I mean, I love that. Yeah. <laughs> the exhibition that uh, Nona Kalu um, took part in in Belgium, which was um, curated by Mad Musée, um, was I, I, one of the best experiences in terms of getting her work out there. And her, you know, she's in the prime of her practice, really. Um, and she was able to make her work on site, was filmed doing so. She to totally rose to the platform of creating live in that moment. Totally loved every moment of it. Um, but, you know, the exhibition itself had a title, which I can't pronounce. Can you pronounce the title? Yeah, <laughs> which, which hints at a sort of chaos. So there were four artists who took part in the exhibition, all of them created work on site. Nona was one of them. Um, but she didn't have to explain what she was doing to anybody. She didn't have to label or title her work. Yeah. You know, it was very free and open. So the exhibition itself was titled, but that was it. People could just come in and interpret the work in entirely their own way. Perfect, you know, for me that's perfect because it just it, it gave the best platform for her. You know, I felt like she wasn't being sort of um, railroaded into any particular way of being, and it was very liberating. And I think watching her working in that setting where she could build um, on site however she wanted to, I was the most able I'd ever seen her. She was the most undisabled, you know, she was a completely free bird which was, I'm hoping that we can build on that and provide more opportunities for her to do that. But it's, it's, it's the labelling of things which can be very difficult and, um, you know, something that's constantly being explored and ideas evolving around that. I said, when I see my patients perform a more sound with music, but it's wonderful. It's putting it inside of them and taking their anger out on something <laughs> that's great or some angry rap is one of them. I think for some of the artists like Angus, I, I think what was so incredible about Joyce's expedition to, to find unearthing this work was that, in a sense, Angus was hiding it. He would he would create it, he would weave it in, in the fields of the hospital, and then he would hide it. And and I think that, that it, there is a tension between a lot of the artists extraordinary and the same, and this idea of then revealing it and, and putting it in a gallery or revealing it and, and talking about it. There is this sort of tension between how much, I mean, Angus's story is slightly different because Joyce, he was still alive and Joyce could talk to him about what she was trying to do with that work. But for some of these artists, you can and and you just, there is a feeling that you, you're exposing a part of them when we're talking about communication that, that maybe they, they don't want that to then be interpreted as things. So there is a real, a real tension there. And with the evidence and we name the artist, and that's, that's controversial, we can't ask them a little bit. We never ask them that, but we decided that their lives were lost and hidden in the silence, and to do the same again, deny their existence, deny their identity, deny their work, it wouldn't be right. But we we discussed that long and hard. It's a difficult question. Yeah. The intent of what yeah. the work was made for. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was ever felt that it was going to be viewed publicly. So, no, I do agree with your stance, that would be enough. But. And we spent a lot of time, and we're, most seminars, we raise the discussion again. Yeah. Are we right to yeah. these people who never consent, who never, mm -hmm. never had a choice in them? Uh, before we, I took uh, Nana to Belgium, the night before I went, my partner said, 
kids they sent to Cuba. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I keep saying that. <laughs> <laughs> You know, and, uh, and Cheryl, uh, my manager, you know, we've, we've discussed this, uh, discussed these things many times, you know, we have a long relationship with our artists where we have really, really got to know them. There has to be a leap of faith that we are doing what we think they're really, really going to enjoy and is relevant and appropriate and beneficial to their practice and to them as a human being. And, um, you know, I was nervous beforehand. You're taking someone who can't say, do you know what, I'd really like to go to Belgium and, and put a big exhibition together. Um, she can't do any of that. So, you know, we took her there, I had lots of discussions about it with her beforehand so that she could absorb that information. When we arrived in Liège, her eyes just were like saucers. It was just like the shock of being in a different place. Um, uh, but she was amazing. She totally thrived like I'd never seen her thrive. She loved every moment of it, and it makes me feel that that we, you know, Mayna really could do anything, and it was absolutely the right thing to do for her. Yeah, but it's a gamble. I guess it's a gamble. It was a massive gamble, and it paid off. Yeah. But you know, you're part of you is thinking, oh my god, yeah. it's all going to go wrong. Yeah. It's all going to go wrong in public and yeah. in the film. Um, but and you know, and it is a big risk. You're working with people who can't express yeah. themselves, and well, it's you're like me and Colour. You know, I, as I said earlier, I discuss it with someone and take that. Well, it's not much of a risk, but you, you you've got to deal with that bit of tension. Risk worth taking once it paid off. Yeah. Well, I've just spent two weeks um, where we took over an empty shop, and our artists have done back to back installations and workshops. And again, it's a big risk because we're in the public, we're exposing ourselves immensely. But um, the artists that I selected to all take part in that are all people who really thrive in that situation. So they thrive having a public platform for their work to develop. But it, it, is, it is a big risk, but it kind of makes everybody, everyone rises to the occasion. I mean, it's the opposite of being hidden away, making work, you know, yeah. kind of really making it quite public. But it makes Nana's work, so I'll just make this very brief, you know, for uh, Nana and Linda, who I both talked about, you know, they're really not interested in their own product, generally. Linda will play with hers for a bit till it breaks and then she'll discard it. And Nana just wants to keep rapping and has got no end point. And for them, it's all about the making. And no sacred element to the object. No, it's it's it's, uh, it's the process. It's yeah. the process. So yeah. then, and then making that, it, and it, you know, when we have exhibitions that are very formal exhibitions, they can feel very flat and boring. But the artists very much become part of the process, and when people see that being made, it's so powerful. It really is a very powerful thing, and it makes sense for our artists and it kind of makes sense for the audience as well. So we're sort of constantly trying to find new ways to show the work as living, live exhibitions that are happening in front of people. Thank you. Sorry. That's fine. <laughs> um, uh, I'm gonna, we're going to stop for a few minutes. If you want to ask a question, put your hand up. And um, if you can introduce yourself briefly as well before you speak. So I'm hoping there's a whole range of people asking questions. <laughs> so we'll the microphone. Or you no, have to speak. Yeah. That's fine. 